Welcome everyone and good morning. Um, this is our Stand Against Racism. It's co-sponsored co this year by the YWCA New Britain and the New Britain Chamber of Commerce. The Stand Against Racism takes place annually in April and is a signature campaign of the YWCA USA and the YWCA affiliates. So we raise awareness about the negative impact of institutional and structural racism in our communities, and we build community among those who work for racial justice as part of this campaign. It's one part of our larger national strategy to fulfill our mission of eliminating racism. Founded by WCA Trenton and YWCA Princeton in 2007, it has grown to involve hundreds of host YWCAs and partner organizations across the country. So I want to encourage participants today to use Twitter or other social media platforms using hashtag Stand Against Racism to share your experience. As I said before, this year we're raising the voices of business representatives from a number of sectors who are centering equity in their places of work. So I want to invite uh, Bill Moore, President and CEO of the Chamber, our co-host, to say a few words this morning. Bill? Thank you, Tracy, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for the Greater New Britain Chamber of Commerce to be participating in this program. In fact, it's more than a pleasure. It's extremely important that we are participating in it. Today's program will be exploring uh, critical issues surrounding racism in the country. We're going to be exploring things, having a general discussions about solutions, consider ways to combat racism, and try to set an agenda for change. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful spring morning. Uh, I hope you guys all have had your coffee this morning, if not your full breakfast. Uh, and I just want to take an opportunity before I I introduce our panelists to do a little context setting with regards to today's um, agenda. So we have truly had a historical and unprecedented year, uh, starting, uh, but certainly not, not finished yet with the COVID-19 unprecedented pandemic that has seen so many people, uh, both at all ages, get seriously ill and, and seriously um, you know, wind up in ICU and many of whom unfortunately have passed away. But no other community has been more badly impacted than the communities of color, uh, where a light has really been shown during this whole past year on all the racial ethnic disparities on health, on housing, on economics, as well as on the violence that has been um, perpetrated on our communities. We saw a viral viewing of a police brutality and a horrific murder on video of the killing of George Floyd, but he wasn't the last one and he wasn't the only one this year that has been killed or brutalized. Through the back, Black Lives Matter and, public, uh, and the public, there was a, an outcry and demonstrations against all of these inequities which had people of all races around the world joining hands and protesting. We also saw and shown a light on the increase in violence and hate crimes against Asians, something that was really stirred up by the past administration by calling COVID-19 the Chinese virus. And finally, last but not least, we had the January 6th Capitol riot slash insurrection, call it what you'd like, backed by known white supremacist groups. All of this has really put us into a position where there has been a convergence of events and situations that I believe have given all of us an opportunity to really make real change in our institutions in our country. It has forced an, a reflection, an introspection, and a real rethinking of our organizations as well as our systems in our country. Next slide, please. So why do we really need diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in every single one of our organizations? 
Well, first and, and foremost, we, we already talked a little bit about societal outcomes disparities. And we know that people of color are far worse off than their white counterparts across every age and income level in education, wealth, economic stability, health, life expectancy, and rates of incarceration. But we also have a serious racial ethnic leadership gap in just about every sector in our communities. People of color are represented at the senior, at the executive and board levels of leadership within both the nonprofit sector as well as private for-profit organizations. And finally, have untapped potential of diverse and inclusive teams. All of this has huge and economic and organizational impact as well. Research shows that if companies had diverse teams, it would lead to better outputs. Scott Page, who's an author of The Difference, How the Power of Diversity Creates Better Groups, Firms, Schools, and Societies, has actually done a mathematical modeling and case studies to show how diversity leads to increased productivity. And McKinsey Consulting Firm has conducted research, which also proves the, the, the case for diversity in companies. Companies who in fact practice diversity, equity, and inclusion are 35% more likely to have higher financial returns above their respect, respective national industry medians. Next slide, please. So some leaders after all of the riots, the demonstrations, the public outcry came out and publicly published policies and statements about how they too were against racism and how they too were in support of diversity, inclusion and equity. But some leaders actually did more, not just stating that they were for equity and inclusion, but actually putting their money where their mouth was and began to work in their organizations. Equity in the Center created a framework for what companies need to look at as they try to progress from diversity into inclusion and finally into equity. And it's called Awake to Work to Work. I just wanna talk a little bit about the three stages and then I'm turning it over to our panels. The first stage that Equity in the Center states is the awake stage. And that's where companies and organizations begin to talk about diversity. They're focused on building a workforce they're focused on building boards made up of people from different racial, ethnic, and other diverse backgrounds. It's what we call the numbers counting game. And it's basically doing a checkoff list. We have one of these, we have two of those, et cetera. But the next stage is going deeper into the organization and really focusing on creating a culture and an environment where everyone is comfortable in sharing their experiences and where everyone, not just people of color, is equipped to talk about race and equity and inequities. This is known as the woke stage. And it's really about inclusion at this point. People are getting trained, people are beginning to listen, people are really internalizing and reflecting on their own biases and how they show themselves in their companies and in society. And finally, the third stage is called the work stage. And that's when we're really beginning to look at equity in all of our, our, our programs, in all of our practices, and in, in all of our symptom, systems. We're focused on creating both the internal and external systems to improve equity. Now, each of our organizations may be at different stages. Some organizations may in fact work on various stages simultaneously. That is all okay. You have to start where you are. The important thing is that regardless of which stage you're in now, your organization is intentionally and actively working on improving themselves and equity for all. I would like to now begin to introduce our panelists and we have four wonderful panelists who will give their perspectives from different um, uh, parts of our community. I'd like to start first with Jason Howie. 
who is currently president and CEO at OK Industries, which is located in beautiful New Britain, Connecticut, where he has worked for the past 20 years in several different roles in both operations and sales marketing. OK also has locations in Berlin, Connecticut and Alajuela, Costa Rica. OK has grown through its focus on building a positive culture, innovation, automation, and strategic investments, servicing primarily the medical device industry. Mr. Howie currently serves on several boards in our community as well. At Hartford Hospital, he's board chair, central region, and serves on the Hartford Hospital System Finance Committee. At the Friendship Service Center in New Britain, he's a member of the Board of Trustees and formerly a board member and treasurer. He's also a member of the Board of Advisors at Acme Wire Products, and he is a member, a board member of Precision Metal Forming Association, as well of a as a member of Board of Advisors of Brigham and Women's Emergency Medicine. Mr. Howie is also working with our very own New Britain High School to build a new Manufacturing, Engineering, and Technology Academy. He has been awarded the Greater New Britain Chamber of Commerce 2019 Distinguished Community Service Award and is a recipient of the 2020 Foundation Champion Award for the Community Foundation of Greater New Britain. It is my pleasure to now turn it over to Jason Howie. Welcome, Jason. Uh, thank you, Rosida. Good morning, everybody. It is an, an honor and a, and, a, and a privilege to speak with everybody this morning. Uh, so certainly last year was uh, one of the most challenging, certainly as a, as a business leader. And after the George Floyd uh, situation, it was obviously a, a, a massive wake up call. And clearly we as an organization, we're not doing, not, we're not doing enough. At that point, what we decided to do was form a DEI committee of cross-functional, cross-race, cross-department, cross-building uh, of several individuals and say, we need to come up with a, with a plan. Uh, the first thing that we did was we came up with norms. Uh, and it's, it's important to create norms because you want to create safety. And that's one of our, our number one company values. And we're not talking about physical safety. We're talking about emotional safety because this is a, it's, a scary, it's a scary place to go. After that, we actually had the DEI committee uh, look at different proposals from consulting organizations to actually help us with our journey for, for promoting uh, and moving forward with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Once we selected our, our consultant that the, that the committee selected, uh, step one is really about education. There's a tremendous lack of awareness by, by many of us. Uh, and part of that train, the training, which we did about 10 to 12 hours over a period of, of the fourth quarter of last year, uh, which included everybody on my senior team, included everybody in middle management, everybody on our DEI committee, as well as our external board of directors. Uh, so it was quite, uh, quite, a, quite an experience and quite a, quite a journey. But um, coming through that, most people certainly felt a lot more aware and also the opportunities that this brought us, as well as just obviously the right thing to do. Uh, our next phase was actually doing a full organizational assessment. So every employee and also as, as well as our board of directors went through a very lengthy process of, hey, where do we stand on diversity, equity, inclusion? Uh, some areas we were doing well, and obviously some areas we were not. Our next phase, which is where we are right now, is forming four different task forces to focus on areas for focus of improvement, but also leveraging those areas where we actually are doing well. And so that's, that's where we are on, on our journey. Uh, but it's been it's been immensely uh, satisfying and gratifying to myself, but as well as many other people. And I'll, I'll share a bit more about that later. But uh, I think the key thing is I was going to reference the same McKinsey study that that uh, that Rosida had mentioned. Who wouldn't want more customers? Who wouldn't want more access to the best talent? Who wouldn't want more access to higher revenues and profitability? You take a look at every single metric in that study. It, it, it's the impact on, on organizations is tremendous. So uh, not only is it the right thing to do, but it, it, it's everybody wins. Everybody gets an equitable and a fair chance to be their very, very best uh, for the organization. And those organizations that have access to the best people, they win. So thank you, Rosida. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. I just got I, I got so into what you were saying. I just want to thank you again um, 
for those words. And, and I'm, I'm proud to say that I was the cons our, our, my firm was the consulting firm that was selected by uh, OK Industries and Jason Howey. So thank you so much. I want to turn it over now to Melanie uh, Strout, who um, is the chair of FUEL, F-U-E-L, which is the Valley Young Professionals Group of the Greater Valley Chamber of Commerce. She has also facilitated and currently still facilitates a statewide collaborative of young professional groups in Connecticut, which led to the coordination of racial ethnic equity training for its members of 10 different young professional groups throughout the state. Melanie is the Director of Civic Engagement at the University of Bridgeport, where she is a member of the University Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council. She also serves on the Bridgeport Community Board for Junior Achievement of Greater Fairfield County and is an advisory board member for Equity Connecticut. Melanie is currently a graduate student studying public administration at Fairfield University. Not too many things on your plate, Melanie. <laughs> welcome, not, not welcome, <laughs> welcome. I want to hear from you and, and talk about your journey. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rosetta, for the introduction. And it's really an honor to be here today to have the opportunity to share some of the work that's being done by young professionals in Connecticut. So as Rosetta summarized, we um, have been meeting as a group for about the last year. Um, and really, a lot of that conversation came out of um, after the murder of George Floyd of, you know, we all agreed that we wanted to do something and that it needed to be addressed. But in a lot of cases, this is the first time that our organizations have really taken a public stance on anything. And so there was a lot of some hesitation on just, you know, we don't want our words to ring hollow. We really wanted this to be a commitment that had accountability to it. Um, and so we are incredibly grateful that the Danbury Chamber of Commerce actually introduced us to Danbury Works, um, who financially invested in our training. So we had 26 young professionals that attended that 10 hour workshop with Rosida and her team. And so it was really designed to support us as leaders of these organizations with the tools and skills that we needed to feel more comfortable addressing racial equity with our members. And so this was really our first step in becoming more intentional about this work um, so that we can begin to kind of address some of the, the clear gaps in the business community when it comes to equity. And I, we really believe that young professionals are positioned to push this work forward. And so coming out of that training, it was really clear that even more so that our young professional organizations in Connecticut are really craving these conversations and these opportunities to learn. I think the most difficult part for all of us in this beginning stage is knowing that we're all going to make mistakes um, and that we just need to acknowledge those mistakes and ensure that we're doing better in the future. And so we've re recently kicked off a virtual book club. Um, which is open to all young professionals within Connecticut, whether living or working, um, which is being hosted by the future leaders of West Hartford in collaboration with CTYP. Um, and as a collective, we're really hoping to provide future trainings for young professionals to really build on these skills. And so I'll just add that, you know, feedback from this training is really the next step for us beyond our organizations is how do we become advocates for racial equity in our current workplaces? Um, you know, I can't speak for every millennial or every Gen Z, um, but we all have lived different lived experiences and really the data is out there to support the claim that we're prioritizing this in our workplaces um, moving forward. And we all have strong value systems and have included that in our choices. But now that we're having this national conversation, I think we're all feeling a little more comfortable to ask for that up front. Um, and so, you know, as you're hearing also from Jason, that company culture is incredibly important in this work. And so a few sort of recommendations that I might make and just being aware is that, you know, creating consistent space for these conversations, it truly is ongoing work um, that will never fully be completed and providing opportunities for young professionals to be a part of your DEI work within your company. Um, and then certainly I'll plug that if you have, a, if you are a young professional or you have young professionals on your staff, have them reach out to their local uh, young professional organization organization, um, there are really some great groups that are working to make their communities a better place for young professionals to want to live, work, and play. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Melanie. And it, and it is, I think uh, it is up to our younger generation to, to teach some of our older folks, myself included, uh, how to do better. As Maya Angelou said, do your best, but when you know better, do better. That's exactly right. Uh, thank you so much. 
I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Nicole Saunders. Dr. Nicole Saunders is currently the Senior Equity and Talent Officer for the Consolidated School District of New Britain. Nicole has, bat, has about 25 years of teaching and leadership experience in urban school settings. She has served as a teacher, instructional coach, curriculum developer, and principal. Dr. Sanders has conducted professional development on research-based strategies necessary for sustainable organizational change. Throughout her career, Dr. Saunders has worked in communities that were similar to where she grew up. For this reason, she is dedicated to inspire children to believe in the impossible and in themselves, to seek encouragement from teachers to work hard and not to settle for less than their internal worth. Dr. Saunders considers herself to be a testament of dispelling the statistics that typically define urban school students. Dr. Saunders is an active me board member for Opportunities Industrialization Center and has served as a board member for the CSDNB Board of Education, as well as the Boys and Girls Club, the Hope Child Care Center, and Leadership Education Athletics in Partnership. Dr. Saunders has been awarded the Central Connecticut State Alumni Award, the NAACP New Britain Branch Award, Women of the Year and several other recognitions for outstanding leadership teachers excellence. Dr. Sanders was also Fulbright Hayes Educators Field School, um, sorry, Fulbright Hayes winner um, at the Field School in Ghana. Dr. Sanders received her doctorate in education and master's of science in educational leadership from Central Connecticut State University and bachelor of science in elementary education from the University of Hartford. Welcome, Dr. Saunders. Thank you, Rosida. As you were reading that, I'm like, who is she talking about? Um, so um, I want to enter this space a little bit differently <laughs> before um, talking about the work um, that we're doing here at the Consolidated School District of New Britain. And um, our superintendent is on the line. Um, so I'm entering this virtual space as a Black woman, a woman of color. Um, with lived experiences in the workplace of what that looks and feel like. And I've said in quite a few um, domains um, over the last couple of, of months in our learning is entering um, any organization as a black woman, my degree of error has to be less because there's always this notion that I have to do better to normalize myself to the culture that has been presented. Um, so that's how I enter this space when we talk about equity and inclusion in the workplace, in the work that we have been trying to do on our district level, starting with our district equity leadership team um, with the support of our superintendent. Um, and it's always nice to know that you have um, individuals who are behind you in this work because one of the things that we are learning is make it local and immediate. So I always have to start with I. This is who I am when I enter this space to talk about the racial disparity gaps that exist for our children. Um, the children that I spoke about in um, my narrative that reflect me. So I internalize this work as a, a woman of color when I enter the space differently in the work that the Consolidated School District of New Britain is doing. And because it's such internal work, you learn about yourself. And it's those windows that allow you to reflect so that you can awaken yourself, Rosida, to where you need to go because it's not a checklist work, right? It is, even as a woman of color, looking through my lived experiences and those possible biases that I inherited from generation to generation because of things that were learned intentionally or unintentionally that has an impact on our work to be more um, equity um, focused and inclusive in the workplace. So I just wanna take 30 seconds to honor the, the district um, equity leadership team members who are here this morning to support me 
um, along with the superintendent, we have Paulette Fox, I believe Maria Sanchez is also on the line, and Virginia Brown. So that will just lead me into the work that we're doing here at our um, on the district level. We have a renewed curriculum that it's focusing on um, culturally responsive teaching and learning practices. We are also looking at our district-wide um, policies through the lens of equity. Um, a key thing that we're doing with our district equity leadership team is creating a five year equity transformative and sustainable plan to ensure that we are meeting the needs of all of our students, adults, as well as our community members. We have four pillars that we're focusing on, student development, culturally responsive practices, leadership development, and more importantly, engagement and, and empowerment for our families. And it's been spoken um, by a few others, and, 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 and more specifically you, Rosida, in our action steps, right? That is, they're not checklists, right? Um, because we have to internalize this work. And by internalizing this work, then we can start with the healing process. Because it is a healing that occurs not only for the organization, but for the individuals who are leading the charge around the work. And in our work is that every component or aspect of the Consolidated School New District of New Britain is through the lens of equity, right? Knowing and diversity and inclusion, knowing that not everyone is starting at that same point. Not everyone will be able to enter that space and say, look, I'm here this morning as a Black woman. This is what I'm bringing into this space. These are my lived experiences. These are how these experiences have a direct impact on my day-to-day -day work. And that's also a part of our professional development to start building that cultural responsiveness of the individual. And, and we call it in our, in, in our work, um, the DELT team in our training with CERF as well as the Pacific Education Group, it's like a deconstruction of yourself to reconstruct where you are and where you need to go for this work. Um, and then it doesn't become a checklist because you internalize um, and actually depersonalize some of the oppressive behaviors that are inherent in many of our organizations, right? And how do we start to have not only those conversations that we're doing here collectively together, but then those actionable steps where we start holding ourselves to and those become our commitments, right? And when we have these commitment statements, they become unmovable and unshakable because everyone who's on this screen today, we're committed to something, right? So how do we do it collectively to ensure that our community of New Britain excels and meets the needs of all of our children, all of our adults, and all of those um, disenfranchised groups? Um, and so that is our hopes, dreams, and desires is that everyone can internalize this work. And then by internalizing it, we can have a better entry point for, for our students. We've also recognized in our setting norms, and I think Jason talked about this this morning, is that we have experienced over the last six months or longer, um, our adult leadership team, um, even our superintendent in our conversations, experiencing a level of discomfort, right? And more importantly, um, we're typically, especially educators, we want to solve problems, right? We want to know if I do this today, tomorrow, this is going to happen. We are learning to accept and expect non-closure. And that is not good for us internally. But these are some of the things that we're working on here in the district with our curriculum, um, um, looking at, our, at all of our policies through the lens of equity, and ensuring that our staff are not only trained around diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is step one, because we're still in our infancy stages 
um, but then engaging in a high level, a deep level of reflection to change our practices and more importantly, own where we are um, in this journey to eradicate um, these racial um, disparity um, um, gaps for our kids, um, whether they're those opportunity gaps and achievement gaps. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Saunders. So important, uh, obviously, we have to internalize and we have to commit in order to begin to put action uh, into place uh, because we all can, as they say, talk the talk, but can we walk the talk? And we can't walk the talk unless we've internalized it and committed uh, to putting it into action. So thank you so much, Dr. Saunders. I would now like to turn over to and introduce Sarah Lewis. Uh, and Sarah Lewis is our, our last panelist. Uh, and then we'll go into our question and answers piece. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat room because we're monitoring that and we will try our best to, to uh, get back to your questions during the Q&A. So Sarah S. Lewis serves as the Vice President for Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for Hartford HealthCare. In this role, she oversees the development and implementation of the system strategy to quantify and introduce interventions to reduce health disparities across the communities that Hartford HealthCare serves. Sarah also leads the healthcare system's diversity, inclusion, and belonging strategy, blending training, education, and recruitment to make Hartford HealthCare an environment in which every colleague can contribute their best work. Sarah holds a bachelor's in human biology from Stanford University and a master's in public health from the Department of Policy and Management at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Sarah, welcome. Thank you, Rosetta. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this panel this morning. Um, what a wonderful way to begin a day. And I just want to recognize all of us for making this space, this brave space on a Friday morning to talk about structural racism, to talk about equity, um, to get comfortable with our discomfort. Um, it really is a remarkable thing. And uh, Dr. Saunders mentioned, mentioned healing. And um, one of the ways that we do that is by making space for one another in our collective truths and histories. So um, it's just really an honor to be with you today um, and to share a bit about our journey when it comes to um, racial equity, racial justice and health equity. Um, and so I, I just wanna say that when we started um, my department, which uh, we've, our department's been in existence for about two years now. Um, Jeff Flax was on the cusp of becoming our next CEO. And um, there was an organizational imperative to elevating the reality of health disparities across Connecticut and also um, elevating the reality that we needed our workforce to be prepared to address those disparities. And, in, and therefore we needed investments in our workforce from, a, from an equity and inclusion and diversity perspective. Um, one of Jeff's initial um, areas of focus was to um, look at our board and, and make sure that we're responding to the, uh, the way that our communities are com com uh, comprised. And, um, and, and over time our, our board just during the um, tenure that Jeff's been in place has more and more come to reflect the communities that we serve, which is really important. Um, I also wanna thank um, uh, Jason for sharing the stage with us today. Uh, he's been an, an incredible advocate for our communities and his role as, um, as a board leader in our central region. And um, one of the proponents of, of not being afraid to look at the data so that we can just move beyond what the um, to, to internalize it and and uh, and make space for the truth that it's telling us, even if it's hard to look at, so that we can then act and make change. So thank you for that, uh, Jason. Um, so last year when George Floyd was killed, the we we really went into every one of those stages that you that you depicted at the beginning, Rosita. We were all over that circle, sort of in continuous. Um, that was sort of the the reality of it, and. 
And we had been calling on our colleagues repeatedly, let's stand up against COVID, let's, let's you know, stand arm in arm um, with one another as colleagues with our communities. And now we need to stand with one another when it comes to racial justice. And, um, and, and Melanie mentioned that in some organizations, we're not talking about this on a regular basis. Um, and so we, we lifted up the, the ways that we already talk about things in a sort of courageous conversation way, the way that we already make space for um, separate realities and, and brought that to the fore to say that in our leadership behaviors around being humanistic and being in the moment, we have to see structural racism. We have to name it, we have to claim it, we have to take aim at it because otherwise it will not go away and we will actually keep harming people if we allow it to perpetuate. So by making that space from a system perspective and, and Jeff Lax I think did that really well, it allowed us to continue um, doing some of the programmatic and structural changes that we needed to make. So for instance, we reinvigorated our system-wide diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging council. And I see our senior director for DEI on our call today to Pamela Lofton McGeorge. Thank you so much for joining us, Pamela. Um, we, uh, we had already been diversifying our early career pipeline programs. We put additional emphasis on that um, from both a um, clinical and administrative perspective. Um, we, I mentioned the board, um, uh, the board diversity. We, um, we also looked at the ways that our, so our board was also sort of holding us accountable to this, right? Like there was, there was the, the imperative from what our leadership within Harvard Healthcare was, was asking us to do. But our board ultimately calls the shots when it comes to our strategic direction. And the, uh, the imperative from them was, this is going to be sustainable change. It's going to be systemic change. We're going to be holding everyone in the system accountable um, going forward. And so that means that when we come up with our strategic plan every year, we're looking at equity, we're looking at diversity, we're looking at inclusion across the board um, in all parts of the system. And again, we're at all different stages. Some are awake, some are woke, some are working, but we make space for everyone to be where they are in it because this is about continuous learning. It's about continuous improvement and not being stuck and being perfect and not being stuck in a place of acknowledging a bias and then feeling shame for it, but then congratulating yourself. I acknowledge that I have that bias and I'm gonna acknowledge it and then by giving myself permission to acknowledge I'm just a human being with bias, I can give myself permission to find a way to interrupt it and not harm other people. Um, so we have this dynamic harmony in terms of how we care for our colleagues and see their full selves in order for them to better care for our patients because there is no healthcare quality, there's no healthcare safety without health equity. And our it's our organization needs to practice that internally every single day in order for our customers and our patients and their families and their communities to feel fully seen. So we have to lift up and recognize that bias can drive healthcare error. We need to lift up and recognize that um, as Jason mentioned, psychological safety within the workplace is imperative to employee wellness. If our colleagues feel that they have to sit in their car and cry before they come into the office because of anti-Asian bias and racism, and they can't bring that into their workplace, then they're not actually, they're not safe and they're not able to do their best work. So we have created a number of spaces and by calling out racism in George Floyd's murder, um, Jeff then made the space for us to call out anti-Asian anti bias, for us to call out um, uh, uh, discrimination against our transgender community members. This is part of the continuum of, of being honest and being, um, and being brave to create those spaces for healing. Um, so finally, I just want to close with saying that um, we we want to be in a position where we can accept that the the next state of healthcare in this country should be bottom line table stakes. Health equity is part of it, and that means that we're going to deconstruct things that don't work. We're going to say, I don't, um, I'm not going to accept that racism and structural bias are determinants of health. I'm going to I'm going to challenge that every single day and I'm going to get the skills that I need to do it. And if I'm just the beginning of my journey, I'm going to look for an organization and this is a workforce imperative here that believes that too. Um, 
and I just finally wanted to lift up. Um, thank you so much for calling out Mother Maya, uh, Rosita. That uh, quotation of um, uh, note when you do better, uh, do the best you can, and then when you know better, do better. We've got mm -hmm. that in some of our slide decks, and it it really speaks to our our culture of um, of being where you are, but and, and being open to learning. Uh, so thank you so much for giving me time to share a bit about our journey, and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Sarah, so much. I, I, it's really important for us to understand that all of our organizations, and some of us in the nonprofit world talk about this all the time, but all of our organizations uh, exist in a context of community. And when we're talking about equity and inclusion, it can't be just about equity inclusion internally within our organizations. It can't even be just about equity, uh, you know, with regards to our own internal introspection. It also has to be about how we carry that with us and integrate that into every aspect of our work, including the work of partnering and networking and, and, and going out into the community. Uh, because that's how we make truly transformational systemic change. And that's how we get rid of racism within our society. If we just keep it within the isolation of our companies, it's not gonna change the world. And we need to change the world, folks, right? We need to change the world, absolutely. So I'd wanna take this opportunity to ha ask some questions of our panelists. Um, you know, there is today. one. There is one question in the in the chat and mm -hmm. from one of our colleagues who's asking about focusing this DEI work on youth and what and youth need some of these opportunities for discussion as well. So what are thoughts on uh, leading these kinds of discussions with young people? Thank you. Thank you so much. I think Dr. Saunders, why don't you take that as the educator in the group? That's a great question. And actually, um, Ms. Fox and I, um, um, as an arm of our, our district work um, and OIC work, we're actually, um, we have some ideas now that we're, we're fielding out to actually get a cadre of Mrs. Fox's um, um, students to be trained in the Courageous Conversation Protocol. So that's one of our action steps. Um, to start the with our kids understanding one who they are and where they fit because one of the things that I'm finding is around um, race and racism for um, a lot of young people or the few young people that I have spoken to and have come in contact with from um, several equity um, equity forum that we we held is that there's this this learned behavior and, and, and I call it this tolerance because of, 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 of the current situation that they're in, that they become immune to certain things and think they're the norm, right? Of, of how, to, how to engage without question. So our idea is to raise their, um, their consciousness um, by engaging them into training around the Courageous Conversation Protocol. We're also, um, and Ms. Fox, you can help me with this one, um, we'll be, um, uh, we're scheduled for a meeting with the director of the John Lewis Center at CCSU next week to even broaden it for mentorship with that group of, of students um, at CCSU. So those are some of the actionable steps that we are taking. So with our young people, they're not short term, they're long term because they're going to have an impact on a group of of, of young people throughout their lifetime. Thank you. And you've mentioned a couple of times courageous conversations. There's actually a, a field guidebook uh, for all of you to th that I would strongly recommend. It's a it's a wonderful. Oh, she's coming out. <laughs> there you go. Yes, uh, Glenn Singleton's courageous conversations um, is an excellent excellent handbook. It has a multitude of exercises that you can adapt and use with younger folks um, and begin to have these kinds of conversations. Thank you. Uh, Jason, can you share with us um, a challenge or you know, that, you, that you had that you've encountered thus far in moving your company on the path to equity and inclusion and how have you dealt with it successfully? Uh, that's a terrific question. Um, so I, I think the single biggest challenge with this whole topic is fear. 
and it's 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 lack of awareness and just fear and you think fear is a human be you know just a human emotion it's one of the most dangerous places to go uh so um you, you know for the for the leaders that are on uh, uh on this meeting that's that's our responsibility um and and you need to you need to it's how you lead in terms of showing humility curiosity compassion um and being authentic and just and, and recognize that you 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 will make mistakes because I, I have and uh and it's how you learn from them and uh, making sure that you're coming from a positive positive intent but it uh it is it is it's about it's about the journey knowing that you may have to take a step forward and be backward to go two steps forward um but it's um it's a lot of this is one-to-one -one work, I think, too. You know, particularly with other leaders in the organizations, or with people that you know that are struggling with the topic, where you're just you're having that conversation. But uh, to me, it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations that kind of builds that momentum within an organization to be able to become comfortable with this and, and move it forward. Thank you, Jason. I think that that's very well said. I do think that leadership has to come from the top and diversity, equity, and inclusion can't be hidden somewhere underneath another department head. It has to be really, really upfront and center, centered in the organization with leadership. And I love what you said in terms of leadership really leading with humility and authenticity and also accountability, right? Uh, thank you so much. Tracy, is there another question you'd want me to Address. Sure. There's there's a question specific for Sarah. Um, mm -hmm. What partners do you work with to address health equity, and do you measure health outcomes and medical errors with an equity lens? Thank you for that question. Um, we work with a lot of partners when it comes to health equity. A number of them are on this um, forum today, and. Part of our imperative when it comes to really seeing and knowing the needs of all of our patients and their families um, is continuing to expand those lists of partners. Um, when it comes specifically to the, the COVID pandemic, we, we worked as hard as we possibly could to, um, to, to march arm in arm with community partners when it comes to reaching out to making opportunities for testing and, and vaccinating. Um, I know that Jason's also on the board of the Friendship Center and that's one of the organizations that we established a, a relationship with when it comes to um, regular testing. And then those relationships allowed us to set up opportunities for vaccination. And um, we, we have an entire vaccine equity operating committee that consists of all of our um, community health and engagement leaders across the system. Um, so we are very fortunate that we have the opportunity to um, liaise through those system leaders. Um, and we always realize that that work is never finished. So also when it comes to the, the question around measuring disparities and uh, through an equity lens, um, that is something that we're quite dedicated to. And as a, as a research institution, we have a number of um, research uh, oriented physicians who are coming together and um, we've created a health equity research council and we're looking to um, really quantify those numbers within our system and publish them and get really curious about disparities and where they show up and where they don't. Sometimes our hunches are actually not borne out by the data. And that is also very instructive because we need to make sure that we're not just following the sort of Hawthorne effect and just looking at where the light is shining, but also allowing the data to take us into some of those darker corners where we don't expect to find things. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting journey that we're, that we're on and um, looking to institutionalize that so that all of our various di divisions and departments have the opportunity to follow that curiosity from a research perspective. Thank you so much. I have a question for Melanie. Um, so there may be other people in this room and other young professionals um, who might wanna know how can they get involved? How can they get trained in equity work, especially if their company, if their own company where they live and work at uh, doesn't have a DEI committee. Can you share some of your knowledge on that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, of course, there's a lot of resources online, as we've all come to learn through COVID. Um, there's tons of lists regarding, you know, other resources that have done a great job compiling everything. So that's always a great place to start just in your own personal world. And then, um, you know, I also would encourage reaching out to your HR department or whoever that contact might be to see if that conversation is happening at work. Um, and then the other piece is really just engaging in the community. There are a lot of grassroots organizations, um, as well as larger organizations from United Ways um, that are investing in this work and like Danbury Works um, that are that are doing this work. And so they're also looking for ways to engage and a lot of times offer trainings and can offer scholarship opportunities for folks that may not be able to afford um, the trainings because we know that that you're paying for expertise, which is really important, but as young professionals, we may not all be making um, the amount of money that we need to, to sustain our own lives. And so that's another step I think I would also encourage. Um, and as our young professional groups are starting to do this work, please reach out to your chambers to see what they're doing as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. I would encourage everyone to start first and foremost with their own education you know, do, doing a lot of reading, as you said, and, and maybe setting up with a group of friends from work, you know, a book club um, where you can pick a, a title that you think, you know, that's been been written, particularly by folks of uh, people of color, I would I would say, uh, would be really helpful to just begin to to increase your knowledge uh, about what people are talking about, how people's perspectives, you know, where they're coming from, et cetera. I, I hate to do this because I really have to, uh, close this workshop and turn it over for closing remarks. But I know that we have at least another hour, if not two, of questions and, and, and more discussion that we can easily have. Uh, so thank you all for being a part of this. I, I, am, I am humbled to have been asked to be a moderator and to have joined our distinguished panelists today. And um, yes, and, and be, care, uh, be, be uh, uh, active and engaged and, and help to create not only safe space, but courageous space, courageous conversations in your community. Uh, Tracy, I'm gonna turn it over to you for our last remarks. All right, thank you, Rosita. We will be making note of the uh, questions and requests for resources in the chat. So uh, we can follow up with folks and send out an email after this is done. Uh, answering as many of those questions as we can. We've had at least one request for a follow-up uh, and have another panel discussion with all our wonderful panelists today. So you all did such a wonderful job. I, I want to thank you on behalf of the YWCA and the Chamber for, for participating with us. And to close this morning, I want to turn it over to Jason, who actually has a story that illustrates how this work um, impacted his environment. Thank you, Tracy. I, I do want to reiterate first just what Rosita said about uh, self-educating. I don't think there's anything more important than that. Uh, two other resources that were very helpful for me was a book uh, called White Privilege by Robin D'Angelo. Uh, and the other one is Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man by Emmanuel Acho, which is kind of almost like a fireside chat. And it, it's about a 300 page book 200 are his conversations and the other 100 are basically all the historical context of it which was quite uh enlightening to me but anyway uh in terms of my story so shortly after we formed our dei committee i was approached by a black female that wanted to join the committee and she said i don't i want to join it not only as a, as, as a black female but also as a member of the lgbtq community and i said Wow, that's fantastic. That's that's truly in inclusion and and and, uh, and representative of what we wanted to do. That second part I told you about education, where we were having these virtual training training sessions, which basically the 30 most senior people in the entire organization, including our external board of directors. And after one of the training breakout sessions, this this woman had unbelievable courage to actually come out. Could you imagine? Could you imagine being able to have that courage to do that? I, I, it was, I'm blown away still to this day. After that, I, my assumption is a lot of people probably reached out to her uh, with compassion. And shortly thereafter, she decided, hey, I want to spear this committee. And 
Now she's fair, she's co-chairing one of the task forces. She is flourishing like you can never imagine. In a private conversation, she shared with me, Jason, thank you. I never thought I'd be able to work in a place where I could come and be my true self. That is when I knew we were doing the right thing. So for what it's worth, again, I'm, I'm, this message was really to the leaders out there. It's our responsibility. And I encourage you to do it so, not only because it's the right thing to do, but you will find it tremendously rewarding. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you all. This is a wonderful way to begin a Friday morning. I apologize for our tech technological problems at the beginning, but I think this ended in a wonderful fashion. So have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, we'll be back in touch because I'm sure there'll be um, additional parts to this conversation. I don't think we're done. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody. Thank you.